All right, good morning. Nice to see you all. Nice to see you all. Yes, sir. Nice to be seen. So um, I'm going to do my best today not to be too lengthy. That's right. Isela, how are you? Hangeth thou in there, baby? <laughs> yeah, the T-shirt. Sa- yeah, but the T-shirt says it all. You guys are awesome. You guys are awesome. All right. Well, listen. We'll get right to it. Um, we do have a lot. To, I have a lot to say, and um, I may or may not do it all. I am sensitive about that sometimes. To the contrary of what you may think. No, I am. But this topic as you know, is it's close to my heart. And it's important that we get through some of these things. And so what I want you to do real quick, if you don't mind, if you have a device, go ahead. And if you have a hard copy, go ahead. But turn with me to today's text that we'll use to springboard in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Hi. Come on in. Nice to see you here today. 2 Timothy chapter 4, I want to read just five verses, and um, we quite honestly could probably evaluate the topic that we're looking at last days by this simple text. It says an awful lot, folks, but I want to read it to you, and uh, so follow along if you don't mind. You all there? 2 Timothy chapter 4. 1 through 5, says this. Paul was addressing his um, disciple, Timothy. And we already know that Paul was getting ready to die. He knew that his time was short. And so he charges his young disciple. He charges him with something. So look what he says. I solemnly urge you, some of your translations will say urge, I solemnly charge you before God and Jesus Christ, who is going to judge the living and the dead, and because of His appearing and His kingdom. Preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Rebuke, correct, encourage with great patience and teaching. For the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine. You know the word doctrine is teaching, right? There's going to come a day and a time that people won't tolerate sound teaching. But according to their own desire, will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itching ear. Or they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. They will turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside to myths. But as for you, exercise self-control in everything, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Did you need to say something? In a sense, I'll talk to you after. Fair enough? All right. So, you look at that and you say, well, Paul was anticipating in the Spirit what was going to happen. So, he says he charges them through Jesus Christ, right? That there's going to come a time, and I believe in my heart, and as do most of you, I would imagine that you're, because we looked at last week what last days meant. We've been in the last days for 2,000 years. We've been patiently waiting, okay, for that great appearing of our Lordship of Christ. But it's through that period of time that we looked last week that there's a purpose for the church. There's a purpose in waiting that refines your faith. There's a purpose in enduring that you stand strong and not let circumstances cause you to do what? Waver. Waver. Back and forth. 
How many people in the last two years have been worried about finances? How many people have stressed out? How many people have done things that they should have never done because they're insecure about their future? It'd be interesting to know how many, right? Scads. Why? Because I think people sometimes look at monetary security rather than spiritual security. So, because why? It's tangible. You can grab it and hold it. You got a $100 bill in your hand versus a dollar bill. It changes your psyche. Whether you like it or not, it changes your psyche. One says, <laughs> that's not enough. One says, I'm okay for a minute. So that's worth one tank of gas. So, as we start this then, we need to consider the what this morning of last days. The what the heck is going on on earth. We introduced an idea of last days last week. We're going to look at what has been transpiring for all these years before the eons of time began. It started. The usurping. The enemy trying to take from God what God was never going to relinquish. Some of you folks really think that some of these things have just begun. Hopefully, if, between this week and next week, if I don't get through it, I'm going to show you that a lot of things that you think just happened have been going on for thousands of years. Okay? So, we looked at it last week. Um, we read it today that the, the harvest is so white out there and we just have to share, right? So, this morning I want to pay attention to the happenings on earth and the charge that God gives us in His Word. That you should charge yourself. Because he says something in 2 Timothy 2. It says that the Lord's servant, we alluded to it last week, but really listen to it, folks. He says in 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 26, he says, the servant of the Lord must not quarrel. Be kind to everyone, able to teach and patient with difficult people. Some people are not patient with difficult people. They're intolerant. They throw a face that they don't even know they're throwing. Your facial expressions come out of your heart. Just as much as your attitudes and your heart attitudes come from the depths of our souls, right? So it's critical, okay? It's not always easy to deal with people. Gently instruct those who oppose truth. There's people that oppose truth. They're not, somebody told me this week, uh, th these people were attacking me. No, they're not. They're not attacking you. The spirit in them is attacking the spirit in you. Okay? Don't fold up like a cheap suit. Endure. Stand firm. Know that they're rejecting your Jesus because He's truth. I'm not truth. I believe in truth. I stand on truth. But in my essence, I was a sinner. Only God is sinless. Only Jesus Christ came as a sinless man to proclaim the truth. And the truth was what? If you keep opposing God and opposing the sacrifice and the remedy that He presented, you are going to endure God's wrath on your life, either now or later. That's the reality of Scripture over and over and over. Okay, so, when you look at it, it says, Gently instruct those who oppose the truth, perhaps God will change their heart. Folks, do you not want God to change hearts? Do you have a son? Do you have a son in here that's wayward? Do you have a daughter that's wayward? Do you have a sister, brother? Wayward, not believing, living in the world, still opposing Christ, and they don't know it. I always tell you about one of my sons. I don't know that he would tell you that he opposes God, but he certainly is not living a lifestyle that's conducive of reflecting Jesus Christ. Okay? Perhaps that God would move on his heart someday. And he has, so it's a good thing. God's faithful. Then it says, they will come to their senses and escape the devil's trap, having been held captive to do what he wants. Now, why do I look at this scripture this morning? If you understand that an unbeliever is captured, listen to me, please. If we understand the spiritual depravity of man, that mankind is dead in spirit, as a result of what our ancestor Adam did. God gave him dominion, and he turned around and gave it to Satan. When he chose the tree of knowledge, he rejected the tree of life. 
Why do people still clamor over knowledge and reject life? That's humanism. That's humanism. That's this relative concept that says my truth is my truth and it's not your truth and I don't have to abide by your truth. It's my truth. Postmodernism. Postmodernism refuted absolute truth, refuted the aspect of God controlling in people's lives, and chose rather to elevate humanity and what else? Evolution. It was better to elevate man's science over God's creation. Is that not true? Happens all the time. Some of you sitting in here believe in evolution. Some of you have been taught that. Some of you just think, I came from a monkey, and I'm just an animal. I don't have a soul. I'm never going to be anything other than what I am. Well, a close inspection will tell you, and I'm just going to let the cat out of the bag real quick here this morning before I talk, because one of these topics is so poignant. You're in the last days because of the elevation of evolution. You're in the last days because what are they doing? They're trying to eradicate God. They're trying to usurp the authority of God and make it so then, in essence, if man's created in God's image and God's image is a monkey, then God's a monkey. But you don't think of it that way. See, you don't want to think of it that way. So here's one for you, T-Rex. T-Rex. Rawr, yeah, ah. Let me tell you something, in my opinion, humble. You don't bite a brontosaurus's butt with teeth this big and a jaw structure this big. Your teeth would fall out. May I suggest to you that he wasn't erect? May I suggest that he bent over and he ate the grubs of the ground and his little feeny peat? And besides that, there's no such thing. Here you go, folks. There's no such thing as prehistoric animals. What? There was no death before sin. Is that true? If there's no death before sin, then nothing died. And if nothing died, then folks, when Job talks about Beomoth and his, his tails like a cedar, we have to gravitate to the concept that dinosaurs existed with man. They weren't there billions of years before. Okay? Just one tidbit of how the age of deception has been going on long before yesterday. Okay? So, people are captured by Satan to do his will, and if they're captured by Satan to do their, his will, then John says in 1 John chapter 2 that there's a spirit. We looked at it last week a little bit. Next week, we're going to get into the man who it will become the Antichrist. I'm going to talk to you about him. I'm going to expose him. I'm going to tell you who I think he's going to be. What? Are you serious? Yeah. Why not? I think. I don't know. You don't know. But I got a pretty good idea. Okay? So, when you think about a fallen world, you think about people enslaved as a result of Adam. To, uh, Ephesians 2, 1 and 2. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. When we're spiritually dead, we're captured by Satan to do his will. The world's running around with people that are captured to do Satan's will. Now, when you think about that, we've been reading through the Old Testaments. Has God not always conveyed to people what His wishes are and His will and allowed man to carry out His wishes and His will? It's God's economy. That's why the great deception is going to be so clear in my head. Because people are going to think everything's going on just as it's supposed to. And then all of a sudden, an intervention, church removed, keeps going, Things start happening. They still think everything's kosher. Until the end when they all see who's left over. The Son of Man coming with His bride. And they stand foot on that place in, in Revelation 19. So if we're under this concept of a fallen world, then make sure we understand that last days is controlled by fallen people. Because that's God's economy. And why is it happening? Because the fullness of time is running out. And God's timetable is perfect. So, when you look at those things, we need to consider people that don't know what's going on. You need to. Because you're a believer and you have the Holy Spirit and so you get to see things that are going on. What about the lost that have no Holy Spirit? 
What about those guys? That they're, they're lost. They don't know what's going to happen. They don't know that Jesus Christ came already. They don't know that he died for their life and their sins. And that professing a belief in Christ can set people free from bondages. How do I know that? Well, isn't it interesting in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 3 and 4, that it says the God of this world, little g, blinds the minds of the unbelieving, that they can't see the glory which is in Jesus Christ. If you're not saved, you don't understand the things of the Word. That's why people get confused so easily. Because the Spirit of God isn't a God of confusion. 1 Corinthians 14.33 Nor is He the God of guilt. He's the God of peace. You say, well, how do you know? John 14.27 Jesus said something to me and to you. He said, peace I leave you. My peace I give you. That's on my tool belt, folks. I try to find peace in the midst of turmoil. Okay? That's the concept. And then Paul says it again. I, I'm trying to really push this point. That these days are surrounded by deception. These days are being ran all over the world by godless men who are captured by Satan to do his will. That's why the rise of witchcraft. That's why the rise of warlocks. That's why the rise of the occult and satanic worship. That's why the rise of false belief systems have been around for so long. Did you think there was an accident when Hinduism showed up on the spot? Do you think Buddhism was an accident or Taoism? Do you think these things are accidents? Why in the 1800s did Mormonism take a place? Why in the 1800s did Jehovah Witnesses under Charles Russell become so prevalent? Why? A usurping of the authority of God to mislead and deceive people. So when you really want to talk about the reality of last days, you have to see the strategy. You have to see the strategy of what's happening. You're familiar with J.R. Tolkien, right? Most of you are familiar because you never read the book. You watched the movie. And Hollywood decided to make it so ugly and grimacing, but you could see the contrast. J.R. Tolkien was a believer. And the, li and the little pub that he sat in with C.S. Lewis, they used to talk about different things. He wrote an allegory, didn't he? He wrote a picture of two opposing armies that come against each other. May I suggest to you that in these days, there's two armies coming together. One army has already been. It's called the church. It's called the church. The church is the army of God. Marching forward, onward, Christian soldier, marching on to war. With the cross of Jesus going on before. God's always saw you as a warrior. God gave everything into your life that you need to win the war. Because the battles that we skirmish about, the war is won. The cross beat it, right? Isn't it amazing? So then you say, well, how do I fight? Well, Ephesians 6 says what? Armor up. 10 through 18, Christian, armor up. Helmet of salvation to protect the way you think. Shield of faith to oppose the darts of the enemy. Sword of the Spirit to fight off the wiles. Shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel. Put on a breastplate of righteousness and pray and intercede for people. Now, does the enemy have warriors? Yeah. Do we just read in 2 Corinthians where it says that he blinds the eyes? So his helmet is a different kind of helmet. It's not unto salvation. Okay? You have to put on a belt of truth, right? So, you see, Christian, there's a point. Now, in this last day's alignment of nations, the globalists want to reset to further their hopes of a utopia. Do you understand that what a globalist is all about? The Great Reset, have you heard the term? Klaus Schwab, the person in Europe, he believes that the elite, and he's 80-some years old, he ain't even going to live. I don't know why they're into it, but that's how Satan uses it. He uses people, and then he discards them. Their utopia would reduce 8 billion people on the planet to 500 million, and then they would have a place so that the rest of us are eradicated and die. 
Do you think it's an accident in the last days that the, the preciousness of babies is no longer considered precious? Do you see what's going on with your children? Do you see what they're trying to do? They, the demonic powers of Satan that are eradicating populations all over the world. I don't think we understand because we don't want to. We're so caught up in, ooh, ooh. What about India? Over 12 million girls. Because they don't have dowries, they're butchered. Think about around the world. Women, they're not precious. Think about children. Look at sex trafficking. You want to talk about last days? What about sex trafficking? Have you seen it firsthand? Have you walked amongst it? Sadly, the precious God-appointed land of Israel is full. You say, how is that possible? Well, because when Russia fell, the Russian mob snuck into Israel. And they brought tons of Eastern Bloc girls with them. Folks, while I was in Manila, I went to Angela City. Some of you military boys will know Angela City. Angela City sat at the base of Mount Pinatubo. And when it blew off, American government evacuated Clark Air Force Base. The Filipinos overran it. Emilio Marcos gathered up all the prostitutes and put them in Angela City. All the ladies in the provinces that couldn't feed their children gave their children to the mama sons in Angeles City so that you see white European males and people of all ethnicity walking down the street with little three, four, seven, and eight-year-old little girls. Because it's okay. And in Thailand, they have Dragon Alley. Are you familiar with Dragon Alley? Ah, some of you are. Dragon Alley, they chain the little kids to the poles and the tourist buses come by and they pay for the kids to have sex. There is a foul, demonic entity running around called pleasure. There is a foulness about Satan that sometimes we don't consider when you consider last days and how they devour these people. You know, the whole globalist agenda is for their utopia because they're an oligarchy. An oligarchy is what Rome was. The few that govern the many and the few use the mob rule on the bottom to create chaos and anarchy. The last few years we've seen chaos and anarchy because Satan used a bunch of kids called Antifa and Black Lives Matter and got involved with things to create chaos to make people cry for more government so that the people would be enslaved to a socialistic Marxist government that's pointing away for a new world leader that's going to come. You say, Rick, did you dream that up? No. But boy, you start to see the alignment, do you not? You say, this is so heavy. No, there's victory in it. I'm just letting you know when you consider last days, evil has to do what? increase so that people's hearts grow cold people are so afraid and so you know some people won't even talk about this sometimes when you bring up these topics people I don't want to talk about it you ever seen somebody I don't want to talk about it why not it scares me should share it should scare Jesus right into your heart I know that so this, this whole issue of globalism is funny because America has always stood in their way. And that's why you have to destroy America. That's why there's tampered elections and inflations and gas prices and food shortages. That's why socialism is trying to make America Venezuela. And if you think I'm out to lunch, go home today and investigate Venezuela. Investigate what she was and what she is. She had gold, silver, minerals, oil, gas. They were a fluent culture, fluent people. Now they're under the banner of socialism and they're starving to death in poverty because the elites wanted their resources. So that doesn't surprise me. Does it surprise you? Yet we know a world leader is coming, this angel of light, this military genius, this economic whiz, this socialistic healer, Complete charmer is going to come about and he's going to usurp and take everything that the globalists are building for themselves. And he's going to take a world spirituality 
And if you look at 2 Timothy, okay, chapter 3, and if you look specifically at verse 5, it lets the cat out of the bag. The so-called destitute church of the tribulation, great tribulation period, will hold to an appearance of godliness, but deny the power thereof. They're empty vessels that profess God, but in their hearts they're void of Jesus Christ and the power that can save. There will be no saving grace in that church. That will be a church of the heathens and the pagans that conjure anything they want to make it fit their desires because we read in these days, people are going to have their ears tickled and and run to what they want to hear rather than what God needs them to hear to be saved. So think about it. I wrote a lot on this man, but I'm going to save it for next week. So really what you're seeing today then is a revealed spiritual war, aren't you? You're seeing for the first time in, in a long time, people aren't even shy anymore about manifesting a godless way of life and persecuting Christians. Can I say to you something that's phenomenal? In case you forgot, our lifetime around the world has seen the greatest persecution of the Christian church ever. More have martyred and been killed for the cause of the cross than ever in the history of the earth. Now, put that behind your head. Even greater than 300 years of persecution, which started from Nero in 63 AD and concluded with Constantine in 315. And the scripture said it, there would be 10 Caesars that would rise, that's what Revelation talks about, and persecutions would commence. 300 years of persecution, they couldn't kill the church until Constantine arose and said on the battlefield, sitting with his generals, oh, I see a flaming cross in the sky. It's an omen. Put the cross on your shields and march to war. And they got victory. So what did he do? He merged Roman paganism with Christianity and he produced the Catholic Church. That's the reality of it, folks. Paganism mixed with Christendom. What happened as a result? State-run churches. State-run churches. Religion started. And over the next thousand years, they would keep adding up to 12th, 13th century. They added things all the way through. Am I picking on them? No. Am I trying to make a point? I am, that last days is this demonic invasion that's been happening so long, we just haven't took time to stop and really look at what's been going on. And in the midst of all that, the Christian church wields its sword and people get saved and people come out of those dark things. There's a time coming, Jeremiah 30 says, of Jacob's trouble. Daniel said it too, the 70th week. Okay, so this revealed war has been revealed before. It just hasn't been time. Now the time is at hand. Okay, what does James 4, 7 tell us? Christians stand firm. Christians stand firm in the midst of trial, tribulations, and things because we're here for a purpose. We're here to share with the person that's lost and lonely. We're here for the person that's contemplating suicide. We're here for the person that's strung out, banged up, And convinced that he has a disease for life and can never be free. Well, diseases come in all shapes, flavors, and kinds, don't they? Some people are addicted to sugar. Some people are addicted to In-N-Out double cheeseburgers. Wrapped in lettuce. No bun. Protein style. (laughs) Some people like tacos. (laughs) Some people like Maseratis. The enemy of the world will give us whatever we want as long as we don't go to Jesus. He'll influence your lifestyle. He'll make a false reality a truth. He'll keep it between your ears even though you bow your knees and surrender. (laughs) He'll keep bringing it back. He'll keep reminding you that you're lost. He'll keep reminding you that you're broken. He'll keep reminding you, reminding you until you get firm enough to say enough. Shut up. A.W. Tozer walked into the woods, stomped his foot and said, Devil, no more. I'm sick of listening. Crazy, isn't it? Folks, 
Jesus said in Luke 10, I've given you power and authority over every unclean thing, every snake and every scorpion. Don't marvel. Don't marvel that demons are subjected to you. Some of you sitting here today may not even believe in a spiritual world. A lot of Christians don't. You know why? Because the church didn't teach them. I've talked to a lot of you. Church didn't teach you. Some of you have been Christians for a long time. And you don't even know the rudimentary principles of what happened on the cross sometimes. Or what happened, why did Jesus come? Why did he set us free? Come on, man, right? If you don't know, find a Christian brother or sister sitting in the room that may know and ask them questions. And if they can't answer, come to me, I'll answer. I'll tell you. Not because I'm an absolute of anything. Because this is. So, Paul went on and another place said this. Listen to this. Actually, it was Jesus that spoke this word. And I thought it was intriguing and I thought I would share it today. Luke 10, 16 to 20 says something pretty crazy. Jesus said, Jesus said to his disciples, anyone who accepts your message is accepting me and anyone who rejects you is not rejecting you but me. And anyone who rejects me rejects God who sent me. Then the 72 disciples returned joyfully, reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us and use your name. When we use your name. Yes, he told them, Jesus speaking, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I've given you, I, Jesus, given you, church, power and authority over the enemy. And you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing shall injure you. When you have that attitude as a soldier, there's not very much that can hurt you. You talk to battle-clad soldiers that were in wars and bullets were whistling by their ears. You know what they'll tell you? The bullet didn't have my name on it. I was bold and courageous because the bullet didn't have my name on it. Do we live as if the bullet doesn't have our name on it? That's how we have to approach life. He said, don't rejoice in this. So anyways, isn't it interesting when you consider God's plan? It was always to use humanity, his sons and daughters. So he raised us up. He equipped us to war in the spirit as spiritual warriors. And by design, God placed each and every person he desired with a specific gift to be used in the warfare for, soul, war, warfare for souls. That's the battle. The warfare is for souls that are lost and blinded. This is why we share, this is why we pray, this is why we hit our knees. Nothing makes my heart happier than to see a person receive Christ and walk into eternity now knowing their sins are forgiven. Does that not bless your heart? Just the idea? And so when we bring people up after they accept the Lord and we give them an applause, you know why we're applauding them? Because we too were in that same place at one time, weren't we? Well, here's another thing, folks, as we continue on our journey. Is this war played out each and every day? Is there battles and there skirmishes each and every day? May I suggest to you that we're on a battlefield of life, not a playground? Too many Christians think you're on a swing set. Life is good, kumbaya. You talk to some of these young people that accepted the Lord recently, they'll tell you that their life isn't so kumbaya. The mental torment that goes on daily in their heads, the enemy's trying to steal their seeds that were planted in their hearts, aren't they? Keep praying, folks. Get beside them. Love them. Don't be selfish. So when we pray, we put on our armor, we examine how subtle the enemy is, we learn his tactics, and always remember the war was won way back when. So, as you think about this stuff and you think, well, is it possible for us to know the information? Yeah. But don't ever get to the point where you're unteachable and think you don't need to learn more. That's right too, isn't it? We always bow before the throne of Christ that He teaches us. That's why we read the Word. That's why we believe that the Word of God is God's Word for each one of us. Okay? Now, do you know what Zechariah 4, 6 says? In light of the surroundings in which we live, it says... Not by strength nor by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. My strength cannot stand and oppose the enemy. But my strength in Christ can oppose anybody. Okay? Not by strength, but by might. My might 
is in the Lordship of Christ. Not by strength, not by might, but by His Spirit. Where did God put the Spirit? In the church. Who's the church? You, the body of Christ. That's where He dwells. It's awesome. So, sadly, what breaks my heart is that the blind are captured. They don't know. They're destroyed. They're floundering in things that they just don't understand. And the saddest part is when a person's mind goes crazy. When a person's mind goes crazy and they're no longer able to function. They conjure concepts and ideas. And they're afraid that they're going to lose their mind because they're bombarded with negativity and oppressive thoughts. And so what do they do? Some people turn to forms to help them with their brain. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with a prescription. Don't get me wrong. But if your prescription becomes your God, then there's something wrong with that. And if you start self-medicating and taking more than you're supposed to, then something's wrong with that. Fair enough? Okay? It's true. So what I tell you now is, is very crazy, but listen to me. So the purpose at hand is a pouring out of darkness. There is a great demonic horde already begun, so fierce... And ultimately, it'll take no prisoners. So many people sit in prisons in their minds. So many people sit back and don't understand what's about to go on. So I'm going to list a few things here in the moments that I have left. Everybody all right? Make sense? Yeah. Amen. Thank you for the amens and yeses. Look at those beautiful smiles. We're in it together. All right. Greater is He. Greater is He in us than Him who's in the world, right? If you don't think you need the person next to you as much as the person next to you needs you, that's right. Hug the memes of the world. All right, so let's get through this. This is kind of fun. This is the fun part for me. Somebody asked me not long ago if I would do a teaching on counterfeit Christianity. And I'm going to, just not this second. But today, for those of you that are asking me, and for some of those wackos that you've been listening to, thank God you're no longer doing that. Let's blow through this. One major thing happened in 312 AD. I told you, Rome Caesar, the general, the self-proclaimed demigod, proclaimed to see the burning cross. Right? He purged it several hundred years ago. Right? And as a result, Catholicism was raised. Many additions were added. Eucharist, sacraments, infant baptism, purgatory, rosaries, indulgences, transubstantiation, etc. Now, as we said last week, there's nothing new under the sun, correct? So if there's nothing new under the sun, listen to this one. To illustrate the point, consider the bishop of Bishop Athanasius. Anybody ever read Athanasius? Missed that class, huh? All right, cool. Bishop Athanasius was the bishop of Alexandria. And in 335 AD, he completed his book called on the Incarnation. As he stood against the world, Carpe Mundum, at the time he was turning, he was turning those who were fixed on Arianism, and he refuted Arianism as a result that the Council of Nicene stated the truth of Christ's deity, but the Arians said, Jesus is not God in the flesh. Did you catch the date? Satan's been trying to undermine Jesus Christ ever since he died on the cross. Why do you think the Jews conjured up a story that he really didn't resurrect? Somebody stole him. This war has been going on since the cross and before the cross. Matter of fact, the enmity that was in the garden was recorded, wasn't it not? That the seed of Satan, Antichrist, little hint, and the seed of the woman, woman being Israel, her seed was Jesus Christ through the lineage of Shem, you will affect his heel. He will affect your head, in essence. Christ was crucified through the heel. This man will be, lose a right eye and lose a hand. More on that later. So the point is what? Athanasius stood against when he recorded that book on the Incarnation. Even back then, folks. So who is a modern day Arian, by the way? Who's under a spirit of Antichrist? Who has the spirit that denies the Father and the Son? Spirit of Arianism is the Jehovah Witness who deny that Jesus Christ is God. Do you find that intriguing? 
John 1.1, 1, 1, our Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, doesn't it? Amen, hallelujah. In the Greek, it's very specific. You know what the New World Translation says? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Did you know that the whole Greek text would be written in black and that little word a, which is a feminine noun in the Greek, would be a bright pink. It can't fit there. But because he's a God, he is not what? The God. And it undermines a person's position, which means they deny the Father and the Son. We read it earlier, didn't we? Well, did you know that the Jehovah's Witness Tract Society started in 1896 by a man named Charles Russell? And because they're Aryan in heart, they're dead. They're not Christian. Contrary to what they want to tell you today. Then we probably should consider Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith, the soothsayer. Joseph Smith in the 1800s who created Mormonism because he was a thief and a peddler and used to use peep stones to foretell the future for people for money, who was an active Freemason, who erected the whole temple structure because of, as a result of Freemasonry, but then made sure that no Mason could ever be a Freemason, as to expose them. See, Mormonism is the God-makers, aren't they? You know why? One of their doctrines is eternal progression. What does that mean? that Mary's having sex with God the Father, Elohim, and they're creating spirit babies so that when a, a Mormon man or a, a Mormon woman have union, the spirit baby comes from the heavens and goes into them. Therefore, the God-makers have made another God. You say, that's crazy. Well, if that's crazy, what about the golden glasses that he interpreted the Bible with? I mean, it gets pretty... Anyways, moving on. This is an introductory... What about Christian science? What about mind science? What about Church of Scientology? What about Protestantism and churches today that say Jesus isn't the only way? Even though John 14, 6, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Mainline denominations deny the fact that Jesus is the only way. Why? Because they want all paths to lead to God and kumbaya. Last days. Acts 4, 12 says there's only one name by which man can be saved. Did you know that? Why? Only Jesus Christ went to the cross and died and resurrected. Nobody else did. Okay? Peace, watch this. Peace in any movement without the cross is not true spiritual peace. There is no forgiveness without the cross and its message. It's like Jack and I always tease each other a little bit. You can go through AA and be a very sober person and still go to hell. What good is it to be sober and clean from alcohol if your soul's dead and going to hell for eternity? Any counterfeit religion without the cross, there's your key. Then we have, of course, Nimrod. You all know Nimrod, right? And the Tower of Babel. Well, you have Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz. What? The Babylonian king and queen. Nimrod. Okay? Semiramis, the pagan trinity as they are known. Did you know that Nimrod died and because the queen didn't want to lose her power and authority, married her son? And said that her son was a reincarnation of Nimrod? And justified it? Did you also know that after a quite fabricated story that goes on and on, that their worship continues to this day? Did you know that? You say, how, Rick? Some of you won't like this. The statue of Mary and baby Jesus, Semiramis and Tammuz. You can read about Semiramis and Tammuz in the Old Testament. Did you know that? They were worshiping Tammuz. Why? Because Semiramis told a story that Tammuz was killed by a wild boar and reincarnated. Satan is a deceiver, folks. So isn't it interesting? Well, what about Buddhism? Buddhism's cool. You get to sit around and, and chant. What about Hinduism and the power of the Om and the chakras? Are chakras cool? No, they're not. Is Buddhism cool? Maybe for them. Buddhism is the one world's largest religions. 
originated 2,500 years ago in India. Buddhists have a belief that the human life is one of suffering and that meditation, spiritual and physical labor and good behavior are the ways to achieve enlightenment or nirvana. What did he just say? That within myself, I am good. I can reach nirvana on my own without anything. It's a lie. Why do I know that? Romans 3, 10 through 18. Nobody's good. Nobody's right. Nobody pursues God. All have fallen short of the glory of God. Interesting, huh? What about Taoism, Shintoism? Shintoism is an interesting study. Hirohito, the emperor of Japan, believed in Shintoism, which believes that your ancestors are gods. So Hirohito thought he was a god, so that's why he could lay away all of his people and have no remorse. Pantheism, nature gods. Polytheism, many gods. Spiritualism, a system of belief that, and religious practice based on supposed communication with the spirits of the dead, especially mediums. They do seances. Conjure up demonic presences and the demonics take on familiar spirits and you think you're talking to your mom or dad or ancestor but you're talking to a demon in disguise. Oh, the last days are very interesting, aren't they? When you start to unravel the true essence of Satan in the world today. How about astrology? How about every day I read my zodiac and today might be a good day and today might be a bad day. They are forecasting your future and God says, I alone am God. What about tarot cards? What about seances and mediums? What about witches and warlocks? What about cults, man-made religious system? What about occults, the direct worship of satanic entities? What about the golden belly button? You say, what? Did you know the golden belly button is what attaches your soul to your body? And did you, you know that you can astral project and go get a channeler and go get somebody outside of your body experience and take you into the universe and discover God for yourself? Through the golden belly button. Astral projection, mythologies. Can you see that Satan has been undermining Christians and undermining God and undermining relationships for a millennia? Jesus said there's going to be a rise of false messiahs, false faiths, heresies, leading to the apostasy of the heart. And apostasy of the heart makes people apostates, those who deny God. We could go into a lot of other stuff, and I'm still doing pretty good. I'm looking at the time. Don't you worry about that. I'm good. No. <laughs> hey, what about this one? My favorite. Ready? Mother Earth. Mm. People love Mother Earth. Well, no, it wasn't the hippies that invented Mother Earth. In English, the first recorded use of the sense of an entirety of the phenomena of the world was in 1266. Natura was the personification of Mother Nature and widely popular in the Middle Ages who invented... So then who invented Mother Earth? The Greek creation, the myth told of the goddess Gaia and the god Uranus who fell in love, and Uranus was the sky god, and Gaia was the earth god. Together they had many children and grandchildren, created plants, animals, stars, and springs. And the unity of Gaia and Uranus since created a sense in the universe was one. So where then did that phrase come from? Mother Earth is the, our Earth is the only planet in our solar system not named after a Greco-Roman deity. The name in Western academia regarding the Renaissance was Tellus Mater, or Terra Mater, the Latin for Earth Mother. Mother Earth is the goddess of the earth in ancient Roman religion. First mentioned as far as 4500 B.C. 60s heightened the concept of the age of Aquarius and removal of absolute truth and the expanding view of postmodernism. It elevated through Satan's fallen angels the doctrines and demons of paganism and Mother Earth spawned by feminism. Interesting, huh? Didn't happen yesterday, did it? Been happening for a long time. Hey, what about climate change? Climate change was first known to many of us as global warming, and the phrase was dated in the 50s. The idea of global warming exists and can be attributed to human behavior. However, the first idea was put forth in 1896 by a Swedish scientist, Savante. The principal issue is man is in the authority and not God. And after all, God no longer matters, as we have the data. This too is religion in the way of belief that says that the planet, contrary to God, and the environmentalists are the current keepers of Mother Earth. 
and their new age concepts of crystal gazing, enlightenment, and goddess worship. Isn't it interesting that we know that the earth can't go on forever? Revelation says it's going to be destroyed by what? Fire. The whole earth is pretty much predominantly water-based, but fire will consume it. Relativism is the claim in the standards of truth, rationality, and ethical right and wrong vary greatly between cultures and people. God is no longer truth. Truth is relative to each individual. And since they oppose the relative or absolute, what's the difference? Absolutism is what they claim, and that word means that you're an authority and you're very dogmatic about your truth. Do you think they're assaulting God's truth? Always have been. Who started it? The sophists. Sophists are considered the founding fathers of relativism, Western philosophy in the 5th century B.C. What about pluralism? Pluralism is a situation in which people from different social backgrounds, religions, and races are together in society but continue to have a different tradition and interest. What is pluralism in the church? Today we have a definition of religious pluralism. Religious pluralism is the state of being where every individual in a religious diverse society has rights, freedoms, and safety to worship or not according to their own conscience. This may or may not include God. You see what happens when the world gets a hold of truth? It paints it gray. It doesn't paint it black. It doesn't paint it white. It paints it gray. Humanism and the rise of humanism destroyed, tried to eradicate the concept of God by introducing evolution. We talked about it a little. A few more minutes here, folks. Evolution is the change of a heritable trait in biological populations over successive generations. How did it believe how did it begin? Scientists believe RNA or something similar to it was the first molecule on earth to self replicate. It was found in a mud That's nice. And then as a result of being in a mud hole from a celestial goo that led to more advanced forms of life, including human beings. Is evolution a theory or law? If by evolution one says the observed genetic diversification adaption of species with the genius, with Guinness, this is known as fact. But, however, if by evolution one means the belief that all life evolved from a common ancestor, this would be at best a theory. Do you remember the law of science? Do you remember that you had a hypothesis? Do you remember that you would plan out and test out your idea, hypotheses, and gain a theory? And then once you test your theory, it became what? Law. Do you see that they went from hypotheses to law without theory? All right. Right? Pretty interesting stuff. Nothing new under the sun. Woke, woke, coined by an African heritage group, BLM began to see things for the first time being woke. They saw God different, they saw themselves different, they saw social injustices injustices different. Has sin ever saw anything other than what sin does to people? That's not an issue of race. They better read Acts when it says that God created all of humanity from one race and one people. There is no racism with God. The outward color has nothing to do with the inward soul, folks. Okay? Why do I say this as we close up? Because any organization, any social gathering, anything that tries to undermine Christianity by substituting a false and deceptive form of Christianity is under a spirit of Antichrist. Any groups that rise up and deny who Jesus Christ is and say that Jesus has changed? What does Malachi 3.6 say? God is immutable. Your God cannot change. Hebrews 13.8, Jesus said, I'm the same today, yesterday, and forever. Amen. Can't add to it, can't subtract from it. Boy, we could get into gender selection. We could get into concepts of homosexuality. We could get into the LGBTQA and I movement. There's all kinds of things being added all the time. So, you get the drift? Lastly, in the next week, I'll touch on Matthew because it talks about 
every one of these things in a different light. But it's the same principle. Always remember, Jesus, when he walked out of the temple, I want to share with you next week something that most Christians just go right over the top. They didn't see exactly what happened. Because you know 37 years later, the temple would be removed and destroyed. That's why God came at the right time to establish a new covenant, right? That new covenant is grace. Not that the enemy didn't try to remove the law with people, but now he's trying to remove grace from people and sell them on law and legalism. It's sad. There's a group out there called Kern, C-E-R-N, and they have fashioned and built the largest particulate separator in the world. What they're trying to do is break down atoms. They're trying to redefine energy. Man is trying to play God. And when man tries to play God, and do you realize something, by the way? Do you know that Kern just started again? First of July. It's up and running again. They're trying to open deep space holes, folks. They're trying to add, they want to see what's out there in a new dimension. May I suggest to you a concept? Because God has allowed man's evil through millennia, I perceive in my spirit and my heart that God is allowing these scientists who have a picture of Shiva, the God of the dead, before their scientific labs. So science is no longer science. Now science is a religion. And they're trying to press into different dimensions. May I suggest to you that the whole concept of the Great Tribulation is going to revolve around this type of thing, that the opening of demonic entities and the hordes that pour because man tries to play God. Some citizens are convinced that the organization is trying to open portals into new dimensions. The particle acceleration project, many are saying that the strong stranger things situation could take place and the consequences of mankind playing God. What might happen? Don't know. Anyways, next week we will do four scriptures on Matthew that talk about the rumors of wars and wars and what Jesus said to do, what he said about it. And who was he addressing when he talked to him? Church wasn't born yet. There's a clue. He's talking to his inner circle of disciples. He's talking to those that are locked into Judaism because he knew. In a very short period, their temple was going to be completely gone. They were going to be dispersed. So not only does he outlay the immediacy of what's happening, but he outlays the future. And so it's an interesting study. It's an interesting look at those things. Okay? So we'll peek at that, and then we'll finish up next week, the, the latter part, with who exactly is Antichrist? When can he be revealed? Why isn't he revealed? What is the spirit of Antichrist? And why is it active and alive today? Let's pray. Gracious Lord, thank you for this time together. Thank you, Lord, that you love us so much. God, that, that you allow things, and you've always allowed things. There have been wars and rumors of wars forever. And you told us this is not the end, it's beginning. And you told us about earthquakes and, and famines, Lord. We find those in the Old Testament. We find them throughout Scripture, Lord. It's nothing new. It's not a sign of anything other than the earth is rattling as a result of the curse of sin. So, Father, each and every person that's here today, Lord, I pray that they are secure in Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that they recognize that only through Jesus is their salvation. Only through Jesus Christ. They may have tried all kinds of things, Lord, and in all those things they tried, they still feel empty. They're still void of purpose, O oh God. I pray, Lord, if anybody here doesn't know you, doesn't know you as their Savior, that that's something they would consider today, Lord. Whether they're online watching or whether they're here today with us, it doesn't matter. Lord God, that you would penetrate our heart. If there be anybody here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, would you simply just lift your hand and say, Lord, that's me. I don't know you. I have head knowledge, but I don't have heart knowledge. And if for those of you on home, at home, online, whatever, if you don't know, it's a simple prayer. It's a prayer of faith that says, Lord Jesus, I believe what you accomplished on the cross. I ask right now that you would come and change my life. Forgive me of my sins. 
Renew me. Help me see you as the Savior of my life. Make yourself known to me that I can make you the Lord of my life. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you for setting me free in Jesus' name. Father, we do thank you for those prayers and we thank you, Lord, for any that said that prayer. Please don't leave here without telling somebody. So thankful for each and every one of you today. God bless you guys. Have a great day. I'll be in the prayer room if anybody needs any.